Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman Family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 95, Doing Jewish for Yourself. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And before we get started, we are doing a sort of NPR pledge drive this month because it is the month of December, the month when usually a lot of people are thinking about their end of year charitable giving. And we just want to put out there the idea that perhaps we might be part of your year end charitable giving. Judaism Unbound is part of an organization called the Institute for the Next Jewish Future, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So anything you donate to us is fully tax deductible. You can go to www. JudaismUnbound.com slash donate to make a donation. We'd appreciate anything from $18 to $18,000. One of the ideas that we put out there is that you might consider a gift of $1 per episode that you listen to. So if you've been listening to Judaism Unbound all year, perhaps you'd consider a donation of something like $50. But if you can give more, that helps a lot. And we really appreciate it at this time of the year. So thank you so much for considering a donation to Judaism Unbound. So we're going to get started with our episode today, and we're really excited to launch this series of episodes where, in a way, we're going to be talking to some of the people that are the people that we would hope that Judaism Unbound might lead to one day, but these people have done what they're doing before they encounter Judaism Unbound. We're really excited to talk to these folks who we see as basically regular Jews who saw a need and filled it or had a passion and followed it and have done some really amazing things that have connected a lot of other people to the way that they're thinking about being Jewish. We're doing this series leading up to our 100th episode where we have a very special guest. And then in episode 101, we're going to look back at the first 100 episodes of Judaism Unbound. And we really see this series as a really interesting way to make it to episode 100 and then to look back on it. So we're excited to launch this series and we are excited to welcome our guest today, who is actually one of the few guests that have uh, verifiably listened to every single past episode of Judaism Unbound. We're thrilled to welcome Frederick Price. He is the publisher of Fig Tree Books, which was founded in 2013, the mission of which is to publish the best literature of the American Jewish experience. So Fig Tree Books is a really exciting company. They recently published the book called My Jewish Year by Abigail Pogrebin, who we featured on some of our episodes about Passover. But what's really interesting about Fred is that he's not only the founder and publisher of this book publishing company. He professionally has actually been the CEO and has played many other roles in many companies in the biotech field. And we think that the story of how he went from being, as he puts it, a drug guy to being a leading publisher of Jewish books and to doing some really other incredible things in his personal life in terms of connecting other people to the kind of Jewish experience that he was looking for that we really are fascinated to hear his story and to talk to him about what he's doing. So, Fred Price, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's really great to finally have you on. Uh, Thank you, Dan and Lex, for having me on. I really appreciate it. I look forward to the discussion. And I especially like the fact that these podcasts air on Shabbat. That's actually very important to me. Well, let's talk about that more. Um, you are. I also want to say that you are are uh, at least in in uh, at least now that it's impressive that we've been around for uh, nearly a hundred episodes. I think you're our first guest who is a verified listener to all of the previous episodes. So <laughs> I, I do keep up uh, on every single one, and I also I, I know this is not an advertisement. Uh, but uh, I, I do I email my friends and I've gotten other people to join as well. And the, re, the reaction and reception has been extremely positive. Well, that's great to hear. So in this series that we're doing this month in, in December, we're talking to sort of as we've defined it, 
regular Jews, i.e. people who didn't set out to become Jewish professionals or professional Jews or whatever you want to call it, who nevertheless have gone on and done something quite extraordinary. You've actually done quite a few extraordinary things. And uh, we're really trying to put this out as an inspiration to what we hope that our listeners will end up doing down the road if they take seriously the ideas that we're putting out there. And so we wanted to start by just getting a little bit of a description of sort of your most public endeavor, uh, which is Fig Tree Books, and then we'll go into the story of how you got from here to there, which uh, includes a lot of other uh, fascinating endeavors. The mission statement is actually very simple. It's to publish uh, the best literature of the American Jewish experience. And those words are actually carefully thought uh, thought through. By literature, we mean uh, in uh, not only fiction, but also nonfiction. And American Jewish experience is very important. We are focused on the United States. Uh, we can make an exception for, uh, for Canada, our friends just north of the border. Um, and the, the Jewish is very important. The authors don't have to necessarily be Jewish. The lead character doesn't have to necessarily be Jewish. But the book has to relate to the Jewish experience in America. We started the company in, in 2013, uh, actually uh, took it, uh, our first books, it took two years to develop our first books, it was 2015. We did six books in 2015 and none in 2016, one in 2017, and we have two in the hopper for 2018. It looks like we're gonna have two for 2019. We're incredibly selective about what we do in terms of not only making sure it meets our mission statement, but it's the highest quality books that we could possibly find. The first six books were fiction. Our first nonfiction book uh, came out this year. It was actually by a well-known author and well-known personality, uh, Abby Pogrebin, uh, My Jewish Year. It was a, it's a really an extraordinary memoir of how a reformed Jew who admits she didn't know very much about the rituals uh, walked through a, a full year of observance of Jewish holidays. And it's not just a, a, a retelling of those events, it's a story of what, how, what happened to her and her family during that year. So that was our first foray, and that actually whetted our appetite for nonfiction. So it looks like for next year, we'll do both a fiction and a nonfiction book. And we're hoping to parallel that, the one in, one in each category for each year in the future. Let's backtrack now, because part of our goal here is to tell the story of how a regular person ends up founding a Jewish publishing company that, or a, a, com a publishing company that focuses on the American Jewish experience. And when we met, you told me a little bit about your personal and professional background, and it didn't necessarily seem like one that would end up this way. Uh, not at all. As a matter of fact, I love the fact that you have regular uh, people as the description. And I, in my mind, uh, I, I think in terms of ordinary people, the 1980 movie. So I'm going to try to play Donald Sutherland in this, uh, in this discussion <laughs> we're having on the podcast. I want to tell you a little bit about how, how I got here. Although both of my parents were Jewish, I had no Jewish upbringing at all. I couldn't spell Rosh Hashanah. We had uh, no connection with the synagogue, no connection with the Jewish community. Obviously, I did not learn any Hebrew. I, I was not a, a bar mitzvah. Uh, I only got really interested in Judaism when I met my wife, who was a member of a synagogue, and she was involved. And so I got uh, quite involved. And I had to learn a lot because I was starting literally from ground zero. I knew almost nothing about the religion a little bit of what I'd read in perhaps in, uh, in college and courses, but uh, nothing on a day-to-day -day basis. I had no concept really of, of what it meant to be a Jew or what the value systems were. I couldn't tell you the difference at that point in time between Torah and Talmud. And so I, I learned as much as I possibly could, starting from, from a, a position of interest and intrigue, but having no actual background. Frankly, it was a little embarrassing at times going to services and talking to members of the clergy when I didn't have much much knowledge. But over a period of time, uh, I was able to get to the point where I think I could safely say I was in, uh, in junior high school and then high school 
in terms of my knowledge. And hopefully <laughs> now I've gotten to the point of, of maybe perhaps uh, being uh, in, in college. My, Mazel tov. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, although my, my parents were, were Jewish, uh, they weren't negative towards Judaism. They were disconnected. Uh, but in, in any event, we joined a, a synagogue and we got fairly active and our three sons uh, all had uh, bar mitzvah there. And one of the things that actually happened a few years, uh, probably about 10 years ago, was uh, actually quite instrumental. And it leads to all of the things that I do as a quote unquote regular or ordinary Jew. And in November of 2007, at the, it was a biennial in San Diego, and Rabbi Eric Yaffe put out a blog at the uh, conclusion of the biennial. He was talking about Shabbat and the whole concept for reform, which is what I'm a member of, was reinventing Shabbat. And what he said was, it will not mean the Shabbat of 18th century Europe. It will not mean an endless list of Shabbat prohibitions. It will mean instead approaching Shabbat with the creativity that has always distinguished Reform Judaism. It'll mean emphasizing the thou shalt and not the sh thou shalt nots. And then he said something which I think is, is in many ways a, uh, a precursor of your whole podcast. And he wrote, the glory of Reform Judaism has always been its ability ability to reinvent itself to meet new spiritual situations. And you could substitute for Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, Modern Orthodox, Jewish Renewal, Reconstruction, the ability to reinvent itself to meet new spiritual situations. And that hit me like a two by four in the back of the head. <laughs> and he challenged uh, uh, all of us who were reading the blog and hopefully the rabbis who were also talking about this from the pulpit to do a couple of things. And the first was to do something institutional within the synagogue itself. And the second was to see if we could do something on our own. So I get the sense uh, that you accepted that challenge. So what did you do next, either within the synagogue or outside of it, or maybe both, as he recommended, to channel Yafi's ideas into something practical? So the synagogue I belonged to at that time, there was an institutional attempt to do something about creating a new concept of Shabbat. And, and uh, I went to the, to the first meeting of it, and the, although there's nothing wrong, and the, the, any criticism I'll make is, is certainly constructive and not meant in any kind of a negative way, but it does reflect a lot of the comments that, uh, that I've heard from other people on the, on the podcast and from the two of you. Uh, about the kind of the the old way of doing things. The first 45 minutes of this meeting were spent by having people go around the room in an open-ended question that said, tell us a little about yourself, which I assume would be my name and my how many years I've been at the synagogue and the temple, uh, sorry, the town that I lived in, which would be, that would take about three or four seconds to do all that. People went on and on and on ad nauseum about who they are and their children and their families. And we had 45 minutes wasted for a one hour meeting. And I, I thought my head was going to explode. And I remember calling my wife from the car and I say, I'm not going to do this because within the synagogue, this is not going to work. I cannot see somebody stepping up and saying, there was no leadership at the, at the meeting saying, let's get, let's get off that. Let's talk about, um, what we could do to reinvent sh Shabbat. And I didn't know very much, what, what could I do about Shabbat? And I didn't want to start to think on a big, uh, a big plane because I'm not an institution. Uh, I'm not somebody who has access to uh, an enormous amount of resources, and I don't have a position in the Jewish community in which I could uh, somehow uh, make a mark. But for myself, I thought I could do that. So I approached three friends who uh, went with me to Torah study on, uh, on Saturday mornings. And I said to them, what would you guys think about if we met uh, before Torah study to start early on Shabbat, very early on Saturday morning, and we were to read books that may or may not relate to the particular Torah portion of the day. So we decided to meet on, uh, on a Saturday morning at eight o'clock at a restaurant and the uh, Torah study started around nine or 9.15. So we had about an hour. 
And we decided to obviously start with Abraham Joshua Heschel's uh, book on, uh, on Shabbat. It's called The Sabbath. It was probably the best thing to do. It was great grounding uh, for us. And over the last uh, nine years, we've read uh, 120 books. And here the interesting thing is it's not always about Jews. Let me give you an example. So we wanted to read a book about Woodrow Wilson for a variety of circumstances. And also we had heard he was a terrible anti-Semite uh, in many, many ways. Uh, and so we, when, as we read the book, we were kind of stunned by the fact that he put Brandeis on the Supreme Court and that Brandeis had a tremendous amount of influence and was in the back door at the White House on an enormous number of, of occasions. And it turns out that Wilson's anti-Semitism could be parsed, cultural and sociological anti-Semitism from religious anti-Semitism. And that was a pretty interesting observation. But what this book did and did for us in many other books, and what I wanted to explain is that how we quote unquote hyperlink from one book to another. So as we're reading in, about Wilson and his relationship with Brandeis, well, that suggests maybe the next book we should read is about Brandeis. So we go from many times from book to book, the equivalent of some sort of a mental hyperlinking. And that's how we, uh, uh, many times, how we get new, new titles. And, and it morphed. And more for another interesting reason that also relates to what, what the two of you do. Of the four people who started, only one is still at the synagogue. Three left for different reasons but all kind of doing our own searching for what is the right environment that we want to get into. And I'm not gonna talk about why I or the other two left the synagogue, because that's really not relevant. But what we did was we decided to meet on Sunday, so we're now the Shavuotov Boys Breakfast Club. I do wanna add something that's actually very important, and that is that others want in to this. People, because they see us, we go to the same restaurant every, uh, uh, it used to be Saturday and now Sunday morning. And my response is always, start your own. I don't, I don't say that in a, in, a, in a nasty sense. I'm encouraging for them to start it on their own. And I've actually offered to give them the books that we've read hmm. and, to, and to steer them away from certain areas. And what surprised me is that no one's ever decided to do it on their own. And they always say it takes a lot of work. And I say to them, well, we're, we're, we're here to help you. We can start you with the list. Uh, we can uh, point you in the right direction. The most important thing is, is, is just starting. And I, I always, often think about the old Honeymooners episodes on TV where uh, Art Carney as uh, Norton would sit in front of a piano and want to play and Jackie Gleason would tell him to play. And Norton would sit there and for like 30 seconds, he'd move his hands over the keys, he'd move his shoulders, he'd move his head up and down. And finally, uh, Ralph would just smack him on the back of the head and say, you know, get going. And that's kind of what I've, in a, in a, in a nice way, what I've tried to suggest to other people who want to do this. It's not that hard. You just have to get going. Take the first step. Call up two or three people who you know, who you think would be interested and explain what you'd like to do. And if you don't get the right responses, don't invite them anyway. Say, all right, maybe it's not for you and go on to, to somebody else. One thing that strikes me about this group and what you spoke about earlier um, in terms of your own experience entering into Judaism a little bit later, even though you, of course, have always been Jewish. And it reminds me of the famous story in the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva, um, who for the first 40 years of his life is not a rabbi. He's just Akiva. He's just a a person. Um, and he only enters into Judaism much later. And it's, it's not on me to, to say that you or anybody else out there is equivalent to a contemporary Akiva, but I think the, the moral of the story is that there's something special and positive about not having Jewish knowledge for a while that allows you, that allows people as adults to have this experience you described. And I actually have people in my own life who they might not have known they were Jewish ethnically. They found out at age you know, 25 that they were Jewish ethnically, and they entered on a similar experience of learning to you. If you could analyze yourself a little bit, what is it about your first part of your answer, the, fir the experiences you've had in your life that make you positioned well to create the kind of thing that you've created uh, in the last 
bunch of years with the Shavua Tov group. Well, there's an irony here because I've always said, I wish I had gone to a yeshiva. To, I wish I had been bar mitzvah. I wish I'd gone to a summer camp. I wish I grew, uh, grew up in a Jewish community. It's a very good question and a very difficult, uh, difficult answer because maybe it's related uh, more to the fact that I'm a little older now. And I've actually thought about, would I have done this uh, when I was in my, uh, my 30s or 40s? And I don't know the answer to that. It was, I think, related to looking, looking for more than what necessarily the synagogue offered, although I'm not saying anything negative about synagogues because I happen to have joined a synagogue now that I think is extraordinary. But at that time, I don't think I was getting enough out of the synagogue. I don't think I was getting enough out of Jewish literature, Jewish learning. And there's a point in time where you say to yourself, you know, if not, if not now, when? We can't keep postponing these things. So we have to either decide that it's important and we want to learn more and read more and understand more and interact in a different way, or we say it's not that important. And I respect the people who say it's not that important. That's okay. That works for them. It wasn't working for me. Can you talk about that aspect that you said, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, but you said, you know, I recently feel like I just made it to college or something, you know, and, and I'm looking at this list of at least uh, as I have it, 122 books that you've uh, read through the Shavuotov uh, book, uh, Shavuotov Club. And I would say the vast majority of them um, I have not read. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting that somehow people tend to have a sense of their own Jewish educations as inferior if they didn't have that sort of childhood Jewish education. And yet the the truth is, I think, that in many of these cases, if we actually looked at and saw what these folks have have actually learned, it's it's substantially more than many of the people whose Jewish education ends, let's say, in high school, at the, at the end of high school, if they've gone to a day school, and they might uh, be able to read Talmud in the original Aramaic, sort of, but they certainly haven't read all of these books and the wide variety. And so I'm, I'm just curious in your thinking and, and helping us kind of uh, think through and maybe find language to talk uh, to, talk to people uh, about this with, because... Fundamentally, I think one of the limiting factors of people feeling free to be creative in their own Jewish lives and in building things for others is some sense, but I don't know enough. I will answer that, but I want to start with a little bit of a, of a short anecdote, and that is I read The Great Gatsby for the first time in college. I read it for the second time in a book group when I was in my late 20s. And I read it again last year. And the Great Gatsby that I read last year, although the words were identical to the Great Gatsby of the other, the other uh, times I read, it was completely different. My take on the book was completely different. I've suggested, for example, to some people, we read, obviously we read this at, at Boys Club, to people outside of Boys Club, you know, you ought to read the Great Gatsby. And the answer is, ah, I read it in college. Yeah, but but it's a different book when you read it now. And your view of his anti-Semitism, which you might not even have picked up the first time around mm -hmm. because it was subtle in there, now kind of screams at you and you want to you want to tear your hair out at certain sections of the book, also realizing that it's it's a well-written piece of literature. So so that's that's I think is 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 very important. A lot of this has to do actually with with self-confidence. I know that may seem like a non-answer, but I, I actually believe it, it relates to it if from my point of view very well. That I'll, I'll take, in my situation, I did have an inferiority complex um, with regard to almost an embarrassment to be able to raise a question. The first time I went to Torah study, uh, I didn't raise my hand at any point in time or didn't make any comment. So I think the inferiority complex is, is, is there I can only speak as a uh, as a Reformed Jew who came to Judaism relatively late in life, or came to acknowledge and understand my Judaism at a at a late point in in life, that there was kind of a tabula rasa, 
that I had a, uh, a blank slate in which I didn't have anyone telling me this is what you ought to study or think about. Although I, I say to myself now, I would like to have had that. I'm not so sure. Maybe it would have inhibited what I'm doing now. So it's a, it's a yin and a yang. I mean, on the one hand, I, I, I wish I had more. On the other hand, maybe this freed me up to be able to say, well, let's, let's do this. So then a couple of years after you started the Shavuot Tov, then uh, Shabbat Breakfast Boys Club, uh, you um, started another group, call, which is which you call Sicha, which in Hebrew means something like conversation or discussion. And that's a larger group, right? That's a group of 10. And this is uh, something that I actually think it relates to your last question. I don't think I could have done this prior to the Shabbat Boys Breakfast Club. So it's an outgrowth of it. There are 10 men, uh, and we have uh, modern Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, and Jewish Renewal. Uh, there are 10 of us. We're uh, about to start our sixth year in December. And it is Hebrew for conversation. And we meet at a, uh, uh, at a private room of a restaurant, the same restaurant every time. And we have readings beforehand on topics. And you have to do the readings, and everybody does. Everybody takes it very, very seriously. I'll give you an example of some of, of a couple of the topics. Uh, the first, one of the first ones we have was called the evolution of Jewish identity in America, the challenges and opportunities of living in a world with unlimited choices. And this relates exactly to the issue that we've just talked about and you talk about on the podcast all the time, that with so many choices, especially in the large cities as opposed to the smaller towns, the Jewish communities or synagogue life is not the center of life, with unlimited choices to things to do culturally, things to do socially, things to do from a religious point of view. So what is our identity and how is it shaped by the American experience? And the answer to that is, and what's great about the Siha is, we have voices not just, they're not all just reform or they're all just conservative, they're from four different uh, aspects of, of Judaism. The one limiting factor is we are all from New York. So I'm not so sure if the Siha were in a uh, smaller town, either in New York, in, in uh, uh, outside of the suburbs or another part of the country that we'd have actually have the same discussions. But the one that's coming up uh, next, uh, uh, next few days is uh, how does Judaism impact your professional life? In other words, do you bring your Jewishness into your business methods, dealings with others? Do you create or enforce organizational issues based on that? If so, how do you do that? And if not, why not? And it'd be, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, discussion. I really appreciate hearing about this. I, and I hope that folks, I mean, we've, we've included this gentle reminder on a number of occasions, but I hope folks out there listening, um, you both think about, you know, oh, how could I take Fred's advice and start my own group? But also, not just how could I start this same, you know, Sicha, but how could I start something that is, you know, unique to my group of friends or special around Jewishness, Judaism, that could be special in our community. Um, so I just want to put that gentle reminder in there. But I also want to come back because um, you mentioned that um, the one blind spot of your group is around the fact that all of you are from New York. And when you when you started that sentence, I thought it was going to go in a different direction. And it, I'm not bringing this up to insult or anything, but I thought you were going to bring up gender dynamics because you you mentioned that your group is all is all men. And um, I I've been in um, I haven't been in any group like yours for such a long, incredible period of time where you build up bonds of friendship i'm assuming and ongoing threads and references back all of that i haven't been in something like that but i have been in many different learning kinds of situations both jewish and otherwise some of which have been designed for one gender just for men and there have been whatever reasons for doing that and it's been thought about and most of them have been not most of them have been lots of different genders um and I guess um, as we think about all this, especially because you're looking at literature and choosing books to look at and choosing authors, how have y'all wrestled with that? And, and how, maybe for people out there listening, how can we all look to, look to latch on to the incredible spirit of learning that you're talking about and do so in a way that, um, that doesn't perpetuate disparities that exist in society um, so that... Um, 
because because I think so many of us hearing you talk, our minds are whirling. Well, like we want to do this. Like I want to. I'm thinking of my friends that will be on board. Um, what are some practices that'll help us do it in the most you know sensitive, effective way? The decision to do it all for men was conscious and was subject to great debate. And as I talk to women friends, my wife and women friends, the women have lots of opportunities and in fact do get together an enormous amount of times for a whole variety of reasons, whether they be book clubs or cultural or, or social. Men generally don't do this. And for each of the fellows that I spoke to, I asked them specifically, do you belong to any groups? Uh, even a book club. And if you do belong to a book club, is it men, is it women, is it both? And it turns out that nobody belonged to anything. So this was a way for men to get together uh, to discuss issues, and we wanted to keep it at 10. We many, many times in our discussions will say something like, if somebody makes a reference to something in the Torah, I'll say, well, you know what? Uh, in Dr. Eskenazi's book, when she wrote, you know, the women's Torah commentary, uh, let's let's look at that, and that may have something different. And you know, so we do discuss the fact that there are there's a fluidity of gender, the people with disabilities, Jews of colors. We're all white, and uh, none of us is Sephardic. We're all Ashkenazic white. And we're very sensitive to that, that there are people of different colors, different backgrounds, there are converts, there are people of different uh, uh, sexual uh, orientation, there are people with disabilities. It would be great if we had everybody um, represented in the group. We don't. We're extremely sensitive to that, however. Uh, and I would say that the model that we've created doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, as in our case, 10 white Ashkenazic males. So connecting back to that question, to the to the upcoming question of the Sikha, the question of how do you bring Judaism into your work life? I'm, I'm interested in the um, mirror image of that as well. How does your work experience come into Judaism? Because, uh, and I think this might also be an interesting uh, transition from what we've been talking about into fig tree books, because one might think that since you uh, do all this, these reading based uh, clubs and have started a publishing company that you would be some kind of PhD in literature. But in fact, you your professional experience is more in scientific realms. And I'm curious whether there's a, a way in which you think that the kind of thinking that you've done in your professional life, either in science or in business or in combining science and business, uh, that, that there's a particular perspective that you've gotten used to from doing that kind of work, which has in some way, probably subconsciously, resulted in, in some of these endeavors. So there's actually one one lesson I learned from my business life that I consciously uh, did for Fig Tree Books. So to give you a very short uh, summary of what I do from a professional point of view, I'm a drug guy. I uh, manage companies that develop drugs. Uh, as Actually, when my oldest son was in kindergarten, they had this uh, a teacher asks each child to stand up and say, what, wh what does your mother do if you have a mother? What does your father do if you have a father? And Josh at that point stood up and he said, my dad does drugs and my mother talks to dead people. <laughs> well, I manage companies that develop drugs and uh, my wife is in the area, was in the area of trusts and estates. So uh, you, as you could imagine, by the way, we got, we got some phone calls that <laughs> evening from the principal, which we had to uh, 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 make her understand and she had a great sense of humor about it. But there is one absolute area that I, uh, I took from, from what I do in the drug business. So what I do for a living is I develop drugs for rare genetic diseases for which there are just very, very small numbers of patients. It's an extremely narrow focus. What we do is we narrowly focus on, for example, 2,000 geneticists or 2,500 pediatric oncologists, and we, we go to them in a rifle shot with very little marketing 
but with a tremendous understanding of uh, how the drug works and the science behind the drug. That rifle shot is what is what prompted me to say when I wanted to create a publishing business, I am not going to be a random house. I'm not even going to be a shock in books, which is a fabulous company. It's actually a division of random house. They're great. That's not what I wanted to do. That's why when I started, I parsed down to the, to literature for the American Jewish experience. Take a rifle shot on that. And I know who my audience is. I know how to reach this audience. I don't reach this audience with ads in USA Today. Uh, I know exactly how to get to them. I know what they read, what they like to, uh, uh, to see in terms of uh, online journals and magazines, what gets delivered to their house. And some people would say, well, you're, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face because if Jews represent 2% of the American population, then you're, you're going at a, uh, at a market which is only 2% of the book market. Well, data is all over the map. There's anecdotal data. I don't know that anyone's actually done the scientific survey that suggests that Jews buy more than 50% of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of what you would call or describe as um, literary fiction. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that, if that number is correct, but I do know that Jews buy a disproportionate number of books. That's a well-established fact. So the 2% is not 2%. Is it 20%? I don't know, but it's something greater than 2%. But I did take that, that basic business approach. And the second thing I did from my business in, in managing uh, drug uh, entrepreneurial biotech uh, companies is to say, I'm going to make use of part-time people. I'm going to make use of people as consultants. I'm only going to use, I don't have to build a big infrastructure. If you're Pfizer or Merck, you have to build a big infrastructure. Um, you don't in small biotech companies. You, you, in many of the companies, we never even did our manufacturing. We outsourced manufacturing to other companies. We concentrated on what we did best, which was studying drugs in the clinic in patients. And everything else was outsourced. That's what I do here. And I brought those lessons from my business to Fig Tree. Right. So could you tell us how you came to create Fig Tree? I mean, what just how did that come into your mind and how, how do you even sort of start to conceive of such a thing? Going through my mind at all times of these books, I'm a, I'm a voracious reader and I'm reading these books and I'm saying, I, boy, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see more of these. Well, how can I maybe make an impact on that? At first I said, well, maybe I'll create a blog and I'll talk about that. But there are dozens of blogs and I didn't know how I could stand out. And so and one day it just, it came to me. I said, I love Jewish fiction. I love, uh, I love fiction uh, about, uh, nonfiction about Jews. And I'm a big student of American history. How can I combine them? And I thought about doing something with uh, the Amer American Jewish experience. And I thought about it, came into my mind. It was the letter that uh, President Washington uh, sent to the synagogue in Rhode Island in 1790. And that was a response to a letter that the was then called a warden, but it's equivalent of a president of the synagogue sent to Washington. And in that letter, the warden congratulated pre the president Washington on being elected the first president. Washington wrote back a remarkable letter. And most people believe he actually wrote this himself, that he didn't have a speechwriter. And he closed by saying, May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of other inhabitants while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree and there shall be none to make him afraid. And this was a quote from Isaiah 36, 16. It's also in Micah 4, 4. And what it said to me was, Washington actually understood the plight of a minority of people. And by the way, when he wrote The Children of the Stock of Abraham, he was thinking about Jews. He could have been writing about Muslims if he'd written it 200 years later. Um, and the idea about sitting safely under your own vine and fig tree, that people who understand uh, the Torah and the half Torah understand that when when armies would come into ancient Israel, they wouldn't just try to, to kill the people, they would 
uh, uh, desecrate the land, they would kill the animals, they would, they would burn the crops. And so if you have a situation where you are sitting under your vine or fig tree, that meant there was peace in the land. And when I, when I saw that, and when I, when I reread that, I said, that's got to be the name of the book. I thought vine and fig tree was a little bit too much, not catchy enough. But fig tree books made a lot of sense to me because it captured the American spirit. I happen to be a, a student of George Washington, think he was remarkable. And what if he hadn't been the first president? What if somebody else with different ethos and different ethics and different concepts had been the first president? You know the old expression, "the fish rots from the head." Well, we we in a good sense we all came came from Washington, and thank God he was our first president. But what it said to me is that's the company. It's the the uh, the conflation of American history and Jews in America. What has been our experience? What a great way to to start by naming really after after President Washington. I want to reach an audience of people who are hungry for Jewish literature about the American Jewish experience. In thinking about the nonfiction book that you published last year, or this year, which was Abigail Pogrebin's book, My Jewish Year, it's really clear that that book is, is aimed at a particular audience and offers something profoundly new to, let's say, non-Orthodox American Jews who are looking for a way into the Jewish material, but could get into it better, perhaps with a guide who they felt is more like them. And I'm just curious if that's also a way of thinking about the kind of fiction that you're publishing, or that you want to publish, you know, is there a, a distinction? Is there something, you know, in, 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 in everything that you've been reading over so many years, you know, what is that special gap, let's say, that you're imagining could be filled, whether by you or if you were encouraging others in general to say, look, there there really is a gap here. You know, there really isn't, from a fiction and nonfiction perspective, this story being told. Could you just help us understand from your perspective what that is as we arc toward our close? So the the issue with Abby Pogrebin's book uh, relates, again, I, I hate to keep uh, throwing these on encomiums to you, but it relates to what you, you, you talk about all the time, and that is the issue of what, how do you define the Jewish community, which today has so many interfaith couples. We don't have any data on this in terms of exact market research, but we know anecdotally that a lot of these books are being bought by interfaith couples. Because what it does is it gives a roadmap, not just for reform Jews the way I was years ago and the way Abby was in the past who didn't know much about their religion, but it's also for interfaith couples to say, here, it maybe isn't as scary as you thought. Um, it's not all uh, uh, black and white in terms of the, what the rules are. There's a lot of gray. Here's a way that you can read about uh, Jews and in a kind of a friendly and folksy way because it is a memoir, although it's serious in, in, its, in its intent, gives you a really good insight into the Jewish community. And I think her book in particular is very helpful for, uh, for interfaith couples. But the other uh, answer I want to give is directly related to, to what, you, what you pose because in the back of my mind right from the beginning has been when I put out a book, what will non-Jews think about Jews as a result of reading this book? I have no idea how to determine in my audience what percentage of people who read a particular book is not Jewish. But that's very important. And one of the, uh, 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 it's a motivating factor, I think, for me, is to make sure that I'm, I'm explaining even if, if it's fiction, and even if it's not didactic, but what, the, what Jews are like and what the Jewish community is like, whether the people relate to it or they say, I don't relate to it, but I now can understand it and it makes sense to me, that's very important to Fig Tree. And it's been right from the, from the start and will continue to be. 
So I mean, thank you so much for all that you've shared so far. We're arcing towards the close. And as we occasionally do, I, I, I'm i just itching to ask a, a whopper of a question that could be, you know, an entire other episode, but I, I just got to get it out there. And then, you know, maybe sometime we'll be able to, to debrief it again with you. But um, just on a macro level, I, I, I've been at all sorts of author readings of books that either they would strongly claim are Jewish books or books that if you called them a Jewish book, they would be very angry with you and say, no, 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 I don't write Jewish books. I just write books. And I'm and uh, like, and both of those reactions are interesting to me. I don't think you, either is right or wrong, but it, they always get me thinking just how would I characterize Jewish literature or what's a Jewish book? Or is there such a thing as a Jewish author that's different from an author who is Jewish? All, all those things. And just because you're so deep into this, both as someone involved with publishing and just as a voracious reader of books that I think would largely consider themselves Jewish books... What's your take on that question? Is there such a genre as a Jewish book? What on a like a on a concrete kind of level makes a book transform from just a general kind of book to being a Jewish book? At the risk of um, paraphr- quoting or paraphrasing a couple of uh, famous uh, or, uh, authors who happen to be Jewish, Philip Roth says he's not a Jewish writer. And Cynthia Ozick says, that's insane. Of course he is a Jewish writer. He writes about Jewish subjects and that's his whole uh, uh, upbringing. And he, everything that he does is flavored by it. And what Roth might say, if this were uh, in the room, he might say, well, I don't consciously do that. And that's fair, maybe he doesn't. But um, there are clearly uh, Jewish writers. And there are Jewish writers who are not necessarily Jewish. And there are Jewish writers who are not necessarily, uh, even if they were uh, uh, Jewish by birth, are not versed in Judaism. There are, I believe, that for the most part, Jews who write fiction do it from their own experience and they do it from a Jewish perspective. And for the, also, for the most part, it's quite conscious. Um, but that leaves so much room for uh, uh, alternative views that it may not have much, much value. I would say that most of the, I only accept uh, manuscripts from agents, and most of them are from people who absolutely understand that they're writing a, about the Jewish community whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and that it's, it's from their perspective, even if it's not uh, telegraphed that way, even if it, that's not what the blurb says about it, but that's certainly the undertone of the book. So I think Fig Tree will continue to be a place for Jewish writers who want to talk about the, the American Jewish community, but I'm happy to take books that are not written by Jews and I think there are books that are not written by Jews that, that can be still considered a Jewish book. Um, there are people who, who consider uh, Updike in many ways uh, a Jewish writer because in his last few books, he wrote a lot about Jews. And now you'd say, well, wait a minute, he's not a Jewish writer, but is it part of the canon of um, the American Jewish experience? Yeah, I think it is. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all that you're doing um, with Fig Tree and for modeling on a localized level what it can look like to to do Jewish yourself. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And I love the idea of doing Jewish for myself. I love to do Jewish every morning that I get up. I say, what am I going to do Jewish today? Thank you both very much. And continued good luck with the podcast. I think it's wonderful. Thanks again to Frederick Price for joining us for this episode. And we want to close it out in the same way that we always do by encouraging all of you out there to be in touch with us. And there are a few ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. Second, you can head to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And last but not least, you can hit us up via email at Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. 
The last plug we like to make, and that we're especially making in this last month of 2017, is that you can always support us with a financial donation, either on a monthly recurring basis or a one-time gift. And you can do either of those at judaismunbound.com donate. So thanks so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.